Welcome everyone, and let me introduce Dr. Gail Rousseau, uh, who'll be uh, one of our moderators. Gail? Great. Thank you, Dan, and hello, and thank you all for joining us for the first webinar in this series, From Pandemic to Progress, Building Capacity Through Global Surgery, Obstetric, Trauma, and Anesthesia Systems. The opening webinar for today is titled Surgery, Suturing the Gaps in Health Security. This series is presented by the G4 Alliance, the Global Alliance for Surgical Obstetric Trauma and Anesthesia, along with GICS, the Global Initiative for Children's Surgery, and the Program in Global Surgery and Social Change at Harvard Medical School, along with additional partners for each of the webinars. And today's webinar is presented with the support of the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies, the Global Surgery Foundation, and Intersurgeon. While today's speakers will be speaking in English, you can select Fr Spanish or French to listen to by selecting the interpretation icon. For most of you, that should be at the bottom of your screen or else for some of you along the top. So click that and then select the language in which you wish to listen. This interpretation into French and Spanish is generously supported by Operation Smile and Smile Train. So thank you. Merci. <laughs> Gracias. We have an exciting panel to hear from, and you'll be able to pose questions to this panel. To pose a question, please select the Q&A visible at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to as many of those as possible. To share your comments with attendees, put them in the chat room, also at the bottom of your screen. As Dan said, my name is Dr. Gail Rousseau. I'm a neurosurgeon at George Washington University in Washington, DC. I'm a member of the executive committee of the G4 Alliance. I'll be one of your moderators. Joining me is my good friend and frequent co colleague, Dr. Key Park of the Program in Global Surgery and Social Change at Harvard Medical School. Key and I are both part of the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies. We have an amazing panel of leading thinkers in the world today about the issues we're about to discuss. You can see them on your screen now, and then perhaps they'll wave as I introduce them. Dr. Jim Kim, who served as the 12th president of the World Bank. Ambassador Jimmy Kolker, former US ambassador to Uganda and Burkina Faso, former assistant secretary for global affairs of the US Department of Health and Human Services, and with me, a fellow member of the G4 Alliance Board of Directors. Dr. John Mira, Director of the Program in Global Surgery and Social Change at Harvard Medical School, Co-Chair of the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery. Dr. Noor Hisham bin Abdullah, Director General, Ministry of Health of Malaysia. Professor Emmanuel Makasa, Director of the WIT Center for Surgical Care for Primary Health and Sustainable Development in South Africa who is himself from Zambia. Dr. Nima Kaseji, Founding Director, Surgical Systems Research Group. Dr. Jeff Ibbotson, surgeon himself and executive lead and co-founder of the Global Surgery Foundation in Geneva. And Emmanuel Ama, Chairman of the Global Initiative for Children's Surgery, uh, JICS. So with that heady lineup, Key, would you, as co-moderator, like to throw out the first question? Yes, thanks, Gail. And uh, it's great to see everyone and welcome to all the participants from around the world. We're gonna get right down to business now. And our first question will be to Dr. Hisham, the Director General of Ministry of Health of Malaysia. Uh, Dr. Hisham, we know that you're a surgeon, an endocrine surgeon, and you also have been working with the ministry for quite some time now. And Malaysia has had a very good experience, if you will, uh, with, with responding to COVID-19. In fact, you have been described as the hero of Malaysia in the way you led the response. Um, so in, in a related, relation to this particular panel, what's been your experience uh, and, and what, what has been the role of the surgical system within the Malaysian health system and, and the value it has provided in responding to COVID-19? Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ki Park. And uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank uh, everyone uh, for having me here. Uh, 
And most important, I think, uh, I am only the symbolic representative for the Ministry of Health. And when we talk about the response for uh, COVID-19, uh, I think in the Ministry of Health and in, uh, in our country, the most important is the collective institutional leadership. And here, what I mean is that uh, the top management, for example, when we look into Ministry of Health, we managed to convince uh, the Prime Minister. So the Prime Minister listens to us and trusts the civil servant. That is the most important. And because of the trust, then we uh, started a whole government and whole society approach. And it's not the Ministry of Health responsibility, but a whole government approach. And here, the COVID-19 have opened up the opportunity for us to look in public health. And surgery is a very important component of public health. Now, every sector is the health sector. Indeed, we are living to see every sector is health sector. And every morning we have a meeting in terms of uh, Ministry of Health, and we uh, have an inter-ministerial meeting and we use all ministries uh, uh, in terms of uh, enforcement of our Act 342, basically to look into the implementation. So when it comes to surgery, uh, we were prepared very early in December 2019, whereby we looked into our health facilities in terms of our hospital and we started uh, you know, looking into the testing and etc. But what we did is, even before surgery, our hospitals already congested. But uh, we planned it very well in terms of activated our uh, crisis response and preparedness center. And whereby we managed to use the district hospital. When we started a global surgery, we started to use a cluster hospital uh, that is actually a district hospital without surgeon. And uh, we managed to decant some of our services to the district hospital and identify seven hospitals for COVID patients only, and including surgery. Uh, and uh, uh, lock, stock and barrel, I think we are looking into the, the development of the district hospital. So the service continue to uh, provide, we continue to provide the services, mainly acute and trauma cases, uh, uh, the uh, services continue. But elective cases, we scale down to about 50%. And, we also mobilized our uh, staff from uh, public sector and private sector to join us in, uh, in the public sector and uh, see how best we can mobilize our infrastructure as well as our staff together. And during uh, December and January, before we have the COVID, I mean the first COVID patient, we already uh, prepared our hospital in terms of beds, our ventilators and our staff. And staffing comes from uh, uh, private sector, public sector, and those retirees, for example, we enroll them and make sure that we deploy them to our respective hospital, the main hospital, the COVID hospital, as well as a non-COVID and COVID hospital, uh, a hybrid hospital and a non-COVID hospital. So uh, services have been, uh, been taken into uh, the non-COVID hospitals, uh, elective surgery, and et cetera. So I think the planning is very important. And we managed to convince the Prime Minister, managed to convince the Ministry of Finance to actually fund our uh, equipment. Well, and Dr. Hisham, let me jump right in there because you've just said things that are music to our ears and that is planning and the great job that you have done in Malaysia and that you personally have led in terms of planning uh, using the government. Of course, we're here at UNGA to talk to those people as well as the financiers of these efforts, but using the planning that you did for a mm -hmm. pandemic and the execution in order to build capacity for surgery. So exactly. thank you for that. And let me, let me then ask Jack, Ambassador Jimmy Colker the next question. You too have been involved, uh, Ambassador Colker, with these kinds of efforts, given your experience with PEPFAR and HIV AIDS in Africa. So what lessons have you learned, uh, Ambassador Colker, that we should all remember regarding global health security? And what role can surgery play in all of that? Sure. Well, just as with AIDS 20 years ago, the goal is not just a biomedical solution, but national scale up. And just as you were talking about, that requires a government-led national strategy, requires participation of health providers and their input, but also civil society and other internet and often international partners as well. And COVID showing us so dramatically that the devil in this is, is in the details. And 
the, both AIDS, pandemics, and surgery all require finding cases early through widespread diagnostics. They need laboratories, they need supply chains, upskilling health workers, referral systems, and community resources to support patients prior to and after hospitalization. And so wherever there's a novel disease, whether it's AIDS or Ebola or Zika or SARS-2 coronavirus, we can't start over. With any new health threat, we depend on surging existing health resources to address it and learn. So it can't be just every village or every hospital for itself. You need a coherent national plan. You need procurements. You need prioritization. And you have to define what capacity exists and what's needed to deal with the outbreak or a novel threat. And these strategies need to be based on existing capacity to treat communicable and non-communicable diseases and on emergency medicine. And so this interdependence has never been more apparent than we see in COVID response. Well, that's great. Well, our yeah. next question uh, will be going to uh, Dr. Jim Kim. So Dr. Kim, um, you know, while you were, at the, you were at the president of the World Bank, you oversaw the bank's response to the Ebola response epidemic in 2014 to 2016. What advice do you have in supporting the LMICs in their response to the current uh, and the future pandemics? And do you see a role in investing uh, surgical systems? Uh, first, let me let me thank uh, uh, my good friends Key and, and Gail for inviting me, and um, you know lots of old friends and uh, uh, new friends. Good to good to meet you all and and see you all again. You know, let me just step back a bit and say, um, you know, COVID has exposed uh, what we're willing to spend uh, in order to deal with what is basically a health problem. And so, in the G7 countries, I just uh, addressed a group of G7 speakers. And, and the figure uh, across the G7 countries was $6 trillion for fiscal stimulus and uh, an unknown cost beyond that uh, in terms of monetary policy, what the central banks have been doing in order to shore up the economy. So in the face of a public health problem, uh, there's no question that the wealthy countries are willing to spend to the tune of $6 trillion. Now, if in fact they had invested in public health systems, something that everybody on this call have been advocating for, uh, we would have had to spend much less than that. All you need to do is look at China, Korea, New Zealand, Australia. Uh, some countries were lucky being islands. Other countries had seen this before and were prepared. And, and the G7 countries for the most part, unfortunately were not. Some were stepping up. Now, when I was at the World Bank Group, uh, the last two things that I did before I left, one, was something called the Human Capital Project. And in that, we showed that investing in health and education is in fact correlated to economic growth more strongly than anything we had seen, more strongly than infrastructure, more strongly than any of the other things that most, that most countries borrow from the World Bank for. Th this, uh, it, was, it was shown uh, that just four indicators uh, uh, in health and education correlated more strongly to previous economic growth than anything that we'd seen. And so to prevent future disastrous expenditures, uh, like the six trillion in the G7 countries, and in order to promote growth, investing in health and education, and, and in, in this case, health especially, is important. Now, in terms of surgery, I think there's, there's you know, in the United States, it's, it's never been more clear that something like COVID will flay open and expose all of the inequalities buried in, in the healthcare system. So in, in fact, while there is plenty of surgical care available in the United States, uh, because it hasn't been done in a way that you guys, you know, you know uh, Key, Gail, Dan, you guys have been proposing, integrating it with health systems in a way that improves your overall health, what we're seeing is that people who have poorer health are dying in much higher numbers than, uh, than, than people who are in good health. So. I, you know, I've, I've been very clear. I think surgical services are critically important. Uh, there's so much of mor mortality and morbidity that's related to surgical care. And, uh, it, you know, this is a fight that uh, uh, I've been, I've been uh, working on with Jimmy uh, through a lot of, uh, of our careers. And what we've been saying is just the bare minimum for poor countries is not ethical. Uh, it's not moral, but it's also just not, not practical and not cost effective. You've got to invest in the full scope 
of healthcare and surger, surgical care is an integral part of it. By the way, I, I was with you guys when you first started surgery. I love the G4 Alliance. <laughs> the fact that you brought all those groups together and the fact that you brought everyone together, this is really, really exciting. It, it feels like I went to sleep for a while. I woke up and you guys are pushing forward. We have got to take advantage of this moment, right? It's been exposed once again that a few hundred billion for healthcare can save us from spending trillions of dollars in the future. And for the countries, uh, it's a very specific recommendation. You need to go ask the World Bank. The World Bank will always say, well, it depends on what the countries want. So the <laughs> countries have to demand that they have the full scope of services. You know, why did the US spend $3 trillion? Because they couldn't go, the politicians couldn't go back to their constituents and tell them, I'm sorry, you're out of a job, you're out of luck. <laughs> if there's pressure from citizens, leaders will change. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, what a, a compelling call to action for all of us and for all of the diplomats who are gathering virtually this week and next at the UN General Assembly. Well, that's a great introduction for John Mira, who will uh, get our next question. John, you led the Lancet Commission in its report on global surgery. You, you produced that landmark report that is so frequently referenced by all of us in this initiative. What would you say is the current situation of surgical capacity in low and middle income countries? You know, thank you. It's, it's great to be here and thank you for inviting me. I would just say I had to chuckle a little bit when Jim said he feels like he went to sleep and, and found what was going on. Jim hasn't gone to sleep on anything. He's been on top of everything every day. So uh, I just want to make that clear. Um, Gail, you know, I, I think what I'll do very quickly is try to give a little context in terms of the history and, and where we've come. So if you think back to 2008, that is when uh, Jim Kim and Paul Farmer wrote that, what is now a classic article that talked about the neglected stepchild of global health. And that was such a vivid me metaphor. Uh, it's, it's interesting how that really galvanized our community. And we went to work and, and we all know that 2015 then was quite a big year because of the effort of everyone around the world DCP3 was published, the Lancet Commission, WHA 6815. And to speak specifically about the Lancet Commission, you brought that up, uh, that, that did a number of things. So it identified a clear vision, key messages, indicators, and also this concept of national strategic planning. And that's been brought up several times. And, uh, and that, you know, part of that came about because of a comment actually that Jim Kim made at the first Lancet Commission meeting where he said that uh, you know, global surgical care is an indivisible, indispensable part of healthcare. So that recognition that it really needs to be integrated into healthcare, it's not a separate thing, it's not a vertical, not a vertical project. So uh, this, this whole concept was of national surgical obstetric and anesthesia planning is, really speaks to that. It's a strategic approach to integrating uh, surgery, OB, anesthesia, and trauma into a national healthcare system. As, you know, Jimmy Colker mentioned that this needs to be a government-led strategy with all stakeholders. And he mentioned that, you know, the devil is truly in the details. And that is what a, a national surgical strategic plan is. And so when I look back at the last, say, 10 years and what we've done well and what we need to do, I, I would mention three things. So one, how do we incorporate this concept of surgical strategic plan into national health priorities? And we've done a pretty good job of that. And you'll hear a little bit later from leaders like Emmanuel Mukasa and Emmanuel Ame who have led those processes in their countries. And that leadership has led to regional approaches. So the South African development community, the Pacific Islands, et cetera. Uh, number two, how do we attract financing for surgical capacity building? And I think that's something that maybe we haven't done as well as number one, my number one priority there. And that's gonna require that we talk to a different group of people. You know, as, as physicians and surgeons, we're not used to necessarily talking to finance folks, but we need to get outside of our little bubble. And then number three is how do we integrate this narrative into the, the, the discussion around pandemic preparedness and global health security? So again, we can't stay in our little bubble. We need to talk to a different community. By and large, the pandemic preparedness global health security community is, is obviously different than our global surgery community. So we need to get comfortable speaking with them. So number one, we need to continue our efforts with integrating surgery into national health planning. Number two, I think we need to be more, more proactive with financing. 
And number three, we need to reach out to our pandemic preparedness and global health security communities. Wow, that's great, John. Thanks for that beautiful summary and then the action points that, that we need to think about. I'm going to go back a few years uh, and, then, and then address this question to Emmanuel Mikasa. Uh, but many of you may or may not know is uh, Mikasa, uh, Dr. Mikasa is an orthopedic surgeon. He was, a, he was the health attache at the Zambian Mission in Geneva and was actually the chief author of the resolution that sort of jump-started this whole global surgery movement during the World Health Assembly. So, Emmanuel, so now you're working with the 16 countries of the Southern African Development Community. And, and, and so how do you see the, 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 the pandemic preparedness uh, as a bridge towards surgical uh, uh, strengthening? Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Kipak, and thank you to the G4 for uh, having me here, and thanks to the other panelists for all the good things that you've said uh, so far. Um, in terms of post-pandemic preparedness and seeing it as a bridge for surgical preparedness, for us in the SADC, and specifically in Zambia, this is already taking place now. Uh, I also want to build on what John just said. Uh, integration of surgical health system should start in the now and should be relevant to uh, epidemic preparedness and response. Um, how so? First of all, during this uh, COVID response in Zambia and many SADC countries, we have had to maintain emergency essential surgical obstetric anesthesia and trauma services through the pandemic. That meant us working very, very closely with all the stakeholders that are spearheading um, the pandemic preparedness for this uh, epidemic, and also ensuring that we are part of the leadership and part of the task force that actually leads the country's response. Um, that we've also seen an opportunity for our teams, when I talk about our team, meaning the global surgery team, because you know in global surgery we have different specialties and a lot of, a lot of actors. And in the management of COVID, as you know, it needs a lot of life support. Uh, basically, that's the main still EU now. And uh, that is a component that's really uh, delivered by our, our people, meaning anesthetists, critical care personnel, in the forefront trying to ensure that people can stay alive until they can recover somehow from the COVID. So you can see the strong contribution that the surgical uh, teams are contributing already and becoming a response in the now. Now, that of course has also uh, created another opportunity. Now an opportunity where the government has asked us to help and map out the you know, life support capacity in the country, the anesthesia capacity in the country. We've had to look at everything, including oxygen supply. Now, as you know, these, all these are receiving a lot of attention and a lot of investments. And for us, in the long run, while we are integrating already into the response right now and being relevant, we are also now looking at how do we leverage all these investments so that they can help in the future work that we have to do on surgical capacity building in the country. And from many papers and a lot of assessment that has been done, you know that our weakest point is our anesthesia capacity. We have a few surgeons, probably more, but our anesthesia capacity and critical care capacity has been very, very low. Even our perioperative uh, outcomes are very, very low from the ASO studies. So we hope that the investments that are being made now in the COVID response can be leveraged for future work in capacity building for surgical healthcare. So that's how we see it playing out. First of all, we are part of the response now. We are contributing to the response now in a very, very strong way, where it matters most for those that are severely ill. And we're also leveraging all the investments that are being made now to ensure that we can strengthen the weaker parts of our capacity so that after the COVID, if ever there will be such a thing, then we can continue to build on that. Thank you very much, Dr. Makasa. Those are excellent action points. And we really appreciate you bringing, in particular, that acute need for anesthesiologists to our attention. Let me turn to Nema Kaseji. Nema, you are a pediatric surgeon. You're the founding director of the Surgical Systems Research Group. You've also worked for WHO, and we're here as part of the UN General Assembly, and, and WHO is part of that larger system. So, what, you know, in the work that you did for WHO and the Emergency and Essential Surgery Division, what role do you see that WHO and, and other or international multilateral organizations can play in surgical 
system strengthening? Thank you, Gail, for that excellent question. And uh, it is a pleasure to join you today. And, and thank you for having me. Many thanks to the organizers and the sponsors, and also to the excellent points made by my co-panelists. Um, I think we can all agree that the multilateral system and, and structures that we've almost taken for granted for a long time are currently threatened, so, so, so threatened by politics, threatened by the lack of funding, and so this is really a time to actually um, argue for, our, for, for, for the need to have these systems in place, to have these structures in place, so that we can coordinate responses such as what we're going through now. Um, and I think as we reposition ourselves and as we fight for what has been in place for, for more than 70 years, there are several things that we need to keep in mind. First of all, we need to be more inclusive uh, because the structures that have been placed, that have been developed so far, um, have been focused in the North, and these are many organizations, many UN bodies as, and so forth. Uh, women are not always represented. Uh, youth are not always represented. Vulnerable segments of the society are not included. And, and so it's critical as we reposition, as we uh, fight for, for the entities to survive, because we need these entities to, to reach uh, health for all, we need to make sure that we are more inclusive. We need to make sure that vulnerable segments of society are included in the definition of any problem that they're facing and they're included in the designing of solutions. We need to make sure that we are localizing interventions um, because of travel restrictions, we can no longer parachute in and out with pre-made solutions. So we have to make sure that we're building local capacity we are localizing interventions. We are uh, including experts uh, because so far you, um, international experts fly in for a few days, tell you what to do and they fly out and, and, and that's how we've done things so far. So that needs to uh, come to, to an end. We also need to leverage systems that are already in place that, that uh, if, if was strengthened uh, locally um, would have more impact. So for example, in the last three months, I've been working with the Minister of Health in CIA in Western Kenya. And oh yes, of course, we only have three ventilators at the health system level, but we also have the community health strategy that has been working uh, since 2007. And so now in the last three months, we've worked with more than 1000 community health workers teaching households um, how to prevent COVID-19, you know, distancing, wearing masks. And so far we've reached close to half a million and in three months, we've only had 73 confirmed cases and, and three deaths. And so using systems and assets already in place, and we've used youth who are at home because of lockdown measures, we've used technology, we've used community health workers who've been working with household members for 40 years. So those are things that we need to bring to the forefront um, as we reposition ourselves as international organizations. We need to make sure that we're inclusive. We need to make sure we're working in true partnership, uh, not me as an outsider telling you what to do, but your mutual learning and, and, and mutual solidarity and support so that we can reach health for all uh, by 2030. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Nema. I mean, we're literally getting a call from Western Kenya from on the field. Uh, uh, thank you for all you do. And we're going to switch now to Geneva, where uh, Dr. Jeff Iveson is located. So here, here's, a, here's a hypothetical, and I, think, I don't think it's hypothetical. I think it's realistic. We could potentially have massive sums of money allocated towards pandemic uh, uh, preparedness in LMICs, earmarked towards health system strengthening, possibly surgical systems. That's a, to, to actually execute this kind of flow of money, that's a massive amount of work. And in January, uh, there was an announcement that a global surgery foundation was created at the World Economic Forum. That's what the announcement was. And this was uh, housed in UNITAR. And, and Jeff, you're the executive uh, director for this. And, and, and so how do you see the role of Global Surgery Foundation as potentially the custodian or the, 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 the implementer of, of, of such a fund? 
Well, thank you, Key, uh, for the introduction, and thank you for the honor of being part of this uh, forum and for all the other panelists and the excellent comments that they've made. So greetings from Geneva, Switzerland, and the United Nations Institute for Training and Research and the Global Surgery Foundation. Uh, before I get deep into the, the question, let me just re-summarize what the end goal we could uh, look at. And as discussed earlier with some of the panelists, we want a strong, sustainable, resilient healthcare system that will be ready to deal with future emergencies such as the COVID pandemic. And the present pandemic has shown the weaknesses. I know that all of us participating today would strongly agree that surgical care is one of the keys to achieving this goal. And I've seen on the front lines how surgical care systems uh, serve as the cornerstone of the foundation of resi resilient healthcare systems. This of course includes all components of surgical care, like Emmanuel said, anesthesia, strong nursing capacity, proper equipment and infrastructure, blood banks, oxygen supply, capable radiology, lab, pharmacy, the list goes on. And surgical care touches on each of these. The question is, how do we manage the massive amounts of funding that could potentially come this way to deal with these issues? And how do we manage funding mechanisms that will ensure that these goals are achieved in a way we envision, a sustainable way. And I believe we can learn from the success of organizations like the Global Fund and Gavi, the concept of pooling resources for greater impact has worked very well for achieving their impact targets. Now they've also implemented robust methods of monitoring and evaluation for impact. And they've also learned over the years of what works and what does not work. So instead of reinventing the wheel, I think it's a good idea to take what has already been established and successful and use it in the unique way for the global surgery uh, community. So I believe that we as a, a global surgery community have the opportunity to build similar funding mechanisms unique for the context of surgical care, for achieving the goals that we're talking about. That is shaping resilient healthcare systems that are built on the cornerstone foundation of strong surgical care. And that will help us better deal with emergencies like the pandemic. So you ask what the role of the Global Surgery Foundation is. It's an initiative started within the UN system at the United Nations Institute for Training and Research. And the concept is that the GSF can serve as a UN based platform for all stakeholders to use to upscale their work in surgical care. Now the main component of the GSF strategy is for it to host, as you mentioned, Key, a pooled resource funding mechanism, which can be built within the unique context of global surgery. And as others have mentioned, focusing on the need to increase access for those who need it most. And in particular, the, the most vulnerable. Being based in the UN system, the GSF offers a neutral platform that can easily interact with all sectors of society, including governments, philanthropy, private industry, civil society, and NGOs. So it is our hope here at UNITAR that together we can realize for surgical care, the massive potential of pooled funding mechanisms as seen as in other organizations. So I, I hope that answers a bit of your question. I'm happy to uh, expand later in the discussion. Well, Jeff, th that is an excellent way of looking at what we're all trying to do together. So thank you for those comments and for framing it in exactly that way. When I hit on two particular things that you mentioned, a potential massive investment and the most vulnerable population. So now I'd like to turn to Emmanuel Ame, who is the chairman of the Global Initiative for Children's Surgery. And of course, children represent 40% of the surgical population in LMIC. So Dr. Ame, as chairman of the Global Initiative for Children's Surgery, how would a potential massive investment, if we can get it, into surgical system strengthening, how would you see that helping children in our future? Uh, thank you, Gail, and thank you everyone for being on this panel. Uh, taking off from what Geoff said, children are, are so, such a vulnerable um, component of our population. And as Gail Joyce pointed out, in most low and middle income countries, especially sub-Saharan Africa, 
the population of children approaches almost 50% of the population. Yet what has happened over the years is for some reason, uh, children's surgery has, has been left out of um, existing surgical programs and even child health programs. And what that has done is has created uh, very huge gaps in one, the workforce um, for the care of children and the infrastructure required to take care of children. So I think that for such massive investment, if we do get it, we need to quickly address, uh, train the required workforce. And that's the, the entire spectrum from uh, children's nursing up to anesthesia, which is such a huge uh, problem uh, at the moment. Uh, now training people takes time. And while we are waiting for that to be done, we then we need to invest in training already existing non-children surgery providers to provide, to be in a position to provide the required emergency surgical care for children, especially at first level hospitals. Existing infrastructure will need to be refitted and reconfigured and re-equipped in a way that can take care of children. Again, especially at first level hospitals, we, didn't know, we do need uh, tertiary level infrastructure, new ones may need to be created. Uh, and we need to create a research capacity in this setting that should be able to do context specific research that they can implement to improve the situation on ground. But the challenge is how do you do this? One of the things that the Global Initiative for Children's Surgery has done recently is to create the optimal resources for children's surgery which creates a guide and a road, roadmap about how this can be achieved. And I think one of the important things we need to focus on is to do things that implement things that will change the situation on ground. I know there's a lot of focus on collecting data. That's important, but, but any data we generate that does not change the situation on ground is not helpful. And that's one, what the Optimal Resources for Children's Surgery tries to do. Uh, and we hope that that will help direct such funding if we do get it. Thank you. Wonderful. So this is, we heard from everyone, all of our panelists, and we're going to actually switch gears and, 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 and take questions from the, uh, uh, the, the hundreds of participants currently uh, live on this uh, webinar. So uh, I'll, I'll start off first. Uh, and it's a combination of two or three questions, and they tend to sort of dwell around this idea of what's next. You know, one question is what strategy do you have in place to have minimum health care, safe surgery in all of LMICs? Um, how does Malaysia uh, uh, plan to actually strengthen surgical care in some of the parts of the country that, that, that's weak? Um, so I'm going to direct this question to uh, Director uh, Dr. Hisham because uh, he's uh, overseas. Uh, the Malaysia Ministry of Health plans. He's been involved with global governance uh, as far as the World Health Assembly. And so maybe you can give us some directions. Uh, what's the role of, you know, ministries of health, uh, development partners, international organizations, and as far as the next steps, what do we do next? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Key. Uh, I think when we look into our country, uh, how do we actually strengthen and empower our, our surgical fraternity to provide the services? And uh, I think number one is the leadership is important and to convince the government to invest in surgery uh, and part of the uh, national strategic planning uh, in terms of uh, uh, looking at the access and equity. And uh, in terms of the urban area and the rural areas, we do have hospitals, district hospitals in place, uh, whereby we perhaps we are lucky that we already have a district hospital in place, but we do not have the services so what we are doing now in looking into the essential services, for example, uh, can we train the medical officer to do certain procedures in the district hospital? And uh, we identify the district hospital and provide a hub and spoke in terms of services. So we are uh, coming up with the idea of a clustering of the hospital, that's number one. Second, the specialty in terms of looking into the primary care, for example. And when they can diagnose the patient, then they know exactly where to refer to. And we do, do have, uh, in the district hospital, two operating theatres. And, and what we need to do is to train our workforce, medical officers, and et cetera, and make sure that you know, diagnosis can be done and basic surgery can be done. 
and it is being covered by the main hospital in the district uh, as, as well as in the state. For example, now we are looking into the North Borneo. We have 24 hospitals in North Borneo, but we lack of in terms of uh, facilities as well as uh, manpower. So now we are looking at full procurement of in equipment, for example, for the whole country. And number two is training, basically the medical services, medical officers, and looking into the complexity of the surgery. Majority of surgery, 60 to 70, 70 percent can be actually trained, uh, uh, can be done by the medical officer, a trained medical officer, for example, appendix and all that. But the difficult part is that we also provide specialty services and how can we actually uh, uh, send our specialists to, vi to visit the hospital or send the patient to a major hospital, specialist hospital, for example. So I think we are looking into that. But more importantly, we must get the government to buy in because the funding comes from the government. And this is why uh, this pandemic has opened up the opportunity for us to convince the government public health is important. So far, until today, public health is not visible. And surgery is a very important component of public health. And because of pandemic now, we managed to convince the government we have to invest more in healthcare, particularly in uh, 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 surgery. I think this is something that our investment, for example, GDP in the public sector is only 2.3% of the GDP, less than 2.3% of GDP as compared to other countries. But we optimize the resources and this is the response that we have now, the optimization of the manpower of the resources so that we can provide the maximum impact, reasonable cost and good outcome. Thank you very much, Dr. Hisham. You, you really have outlined that very well. I'd like to take another question. It was raised by Walt Johnson, who is the former uh, head of the WHO Global Initiative for Emergency and Essential Surgery but many others in the chat room have asked about this. And it has to do with doc what Dr. Hisham just said about individual nations really spearheading the initiative by providing funding. And so I'd like Nema Kaseji and Jim Kim in particular to address the question our, our uh, participants have regarding the funding of WHO. There are some nations that are not paying up. There are some nations that are threatening withdrawal. What does that mean for global health in general and global surgery in particular? So first Nemo and then maybe Jim Kim, if you could address that question, please, from our audience. Okay, thank you for that excellent uh, question, which is quite loaded. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the institutions that we've taken for granted are now under threat and, and countries are threatening to pull out. And I think the US is threatening to pull out six, uh, six, uh, 60 million from, from WHO. And, and this is not the time uh, to do that in the middle of a pandemic. So uh, my feeling is that uh, over time, we've sort of um, taken, that, taken these institutions for granted we have also lost um, the global solidarity that was there right after World War II, uh, because I think we were all on the same page at that point and we all wanted to build a better world and I were maybe even more ideal, um, uh, we, idealistic at that time. And, and some of that has been lost. Um, I think there is more mistrust and distrust. Um, there is more nationalism, and it, this is not unique to one country, uh, but is, it's a trend that has been developing over a few years. Um, and I, I think it's, it's up to us who actually see the, the consequences of, of defunding these organizations, the consequences of muzzling some of the great institutions that have been in place that, that resulted in, in us eradicating diseases. Um, so I think part of it is up to us to convince the politicians that, that um, science and health is sacred and is not something to be put on the bargaining table to, to, get to score political points. Um, and I think uh, it, 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 we also have to just to continue with the work of, of making sure that we are uh, marching 
towards universal health coverage. So those are the two things I would recommend during these very difficult times is to make do with what we have, uh, make sure that we are, are, are really doing things the most sustainable way uh, and in, in true partnership. Um, so that we can save money and also make solutions more sustainable. Um, and I think it's, it is also up to us who are in the, the health field to make sure that we are ambassadors and that we are there to, to protect some of these institutions that have been in place and are, are, more, are needed now more than ever. Thank you. Thank you, Neva. That's great, a great response. And we, we're going to combine uh, three questions, and they all have to do with financing. And these are going to be uh, addressed to uh, Ambassador Coker and uh, John Mira. And, and specifically, uh, Ambassador Coker, what would be the role of the U.S.? Uh, uh, because they have, there's some precedents, right? There's the PEFAR, and that changed the face of global health, uh, uh, you know, historically. And, and is this something that, you know, is possible, a, a global fund for uh, surgical care? Uh, and that's led by, let's say, U.S. And then, then John, maybe you can talk about some of the uh, the high-level you know, perspective on where would money come from for the global scale up of surgical care. We'll start with you, Ambassador Coker. Sure. Thanks. I, of course, it's possible. I think it's politically challenging, and and one of the reasons is that unless the United States and the WHO are at the table and working together, it's going to be very difficult to achieve global health goals and. I think the consortium that got together for the global fund and for many of the areas that Jim Kim has worked his whole life on in, in trying to address these mega problems in, in global health, um, I'm not sure that the preconditions from the US side are in place at the moment. I think we've, we don't realize that the World Health Organization mandate is just enormous and that it's actually done a good job in norms and guidance and technical support. And I do think we should be tripling our assessed contributions as well as increasing voluntary contributions to the World Health Organization, but in return for some reforms. It's not, it is not a dynamic 21st century organization. It's an archaic structure. And I think the creation of these funds, while very valuable, and I think the idea of pooled funds in the Global Surgery Foundation is, is the right way to go. But I think that we can't see this, these as just workarounds to the core business of national strategies supported by norms and standards that, that the Global Fund is uniquely able to provide. So I'm, um, I do think that uh, Dr. Kaseji is exactly right that the, this is, the pandemic has focused our attention on health investments. Dr. Hisham as well is talking about that and now is the time. Great. John? I agree 100% with what Ambassador Coker just said. Um, and I want to add to that and just say, I think global surgery is entering a new era. And, and I think we can no longer say that we're the neglected stepchild. I, I think now we're the poor cousin. And, and the reason I say that is you can't claim that you're the neglected stepchild when all of the SOTIC health ministers have passed a resolution that says, you know, surgical capacity should be part of national health plan. You can't say that when the Pacific Island, 22, 22 ministers of health in the Pacific Island have said national surgical strategic planning should be part of national health planning. But where we haven't gone is to capital and, and to attract capital flows. So um, I think we need to continue with the concept of integrating surgical capacity into national health planning. Yes, but we need to talk about how do we attract capital from impact investors, from venture capital, from private equity, uh, from industry? I mean, obviously, of course, you know, governments have to make the primary decision. And, and Jim Kim said that countries have to demand that surgery is a priority. And of course, that's true. But if, if countries and, and if we want to see uh, capital flow towards investment in surgeries, we have to cr uh, change our arguments. So we've been, we've been operating as if we're the neglected stepchild and we have to shift our arguments uh, to, to attract capital. Great. Well, as we're getting close to uh, the end of our fabulous hour together, we're going to have the last few minutes devoted to a lightning round uh, for a one minute response from each of our distinguished panelists. What we'd like you to think about is 
for all the hundreds of people who are on this call and the thousands who will see uh, it on YouTube and see the other uh, rest of the four webinar series. If you have, you have one minute, what would you like the people who are part of this to do? Surgeons, diplomats, voters, citizens, patients. Well, one minute each, we'll start with Dr. Hisham. What should we do, each of us? You're muted. Okay. I think it's very important for us to come together. And together and unity, we can make a big difference in healthcare, mainly in uh, global surgery. In terms of uh, looking into the politics, in terms of financing, in terms of global procurement and etc. So I think we need an organization to lead us in all the countries locally, regionally and globally. And how do we distribute equality in the respective countries? And this organization is important to convince the government as well. Because today, looking into pandemic, we managed to open the eyes of the government that the importance of healthcare in the country. Great. Thanks very much. Ambassador Kolker? Yeah, let's, thoughts? let's remember the fundamental moral imperative. 20 years ago, if you had HIV virus in a rich country, you very likely survived. And if you were in a poor country, you almost certainly developed AIDS and died. That's what we're seeing right now in global with surgical procedures. People in rich countries have access to needed and life-saving surgery and those in poor countries don't. And, but in some ways, surgery is easier. There's no stigma attached to correcting a deformity or removing a tumor. And once it's done, there's usually no need to remain on medication for the rest of your life. So a national surgical plan should be able to calculate resources, measure results, and get it done with a lot of buy-in from all of the stakeholders who are needed. Great points, thank you. Professor Emmanuel Mikasa, your closing thoughts, sir. Thank you. Um, I think my answer is in twofold. There is uh, what we should do, first of all, as a global surgery movement. For me, the policies are being in place. They are not finalized yet, but many, if, many pro, a lot of progress has been made and it's on its way. What is lacking for us to, 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 you know, to get that funding, to get more support is that we as a global surgery community must try, we must pilot this policy somewhere. Let's pick a district, let's pick a hospital, and the district is the appropriate place because it's closer to the people, where we should pilot the provision of emergency and essential surgical care 24-7 so we can generate the evidence and so we can demonstrate the impact on health system strengthening, on improving health outcomes and on the social economics of the people that receive surgical care. That then we can use to lobby government so they can prioritize this area as an investment area that is needed to support the wider health system. I think that is important and needed now. Wow, great. Call to action, to, terrific. And Dr. Nima Kaseje, your closing thoughts, madam. Thank you so much, Gail. Just a couple of um, thoughts. So number one, I'd uh, just like to reiterate the importance of, of us being more inclusive, making sure that the most vulnerable are included in everything that we do. And the second point I'd like to make is that we need to engage more broadly, make sure we're not working in a silo. So if I can give an example. Uh, in the last three months, uh, since the lockdown measures were put into place in Western Kenya, We've seen teenage pregnancy rates triple. And so that's a symptom. That's a symptom of a social phenomenon, but that will result in the need for more cesarean sections. So we shouldn't just focus on C-sections. Um, we should focus on well, what's going on socially and how can we engage with that? And what we've been doing is we've created a leadership and a mentorship program for young girls to show them you know, what, what is possible. Uh, many of them want to be doctors, want to be nurses, so showing them the way and making sure that we're addressing the root causes, which may not be surgical, but are social, and making sure that we're engaging with different sectors um, so that we, we get more influence and and, and we actually prevent a lot of these uh, issues um, and, and also yeah, get more political, political points that will help us move our agenda forward. Thank you. Thank you, Nema. Professor Emmanuel Ame. 
for the uh, children. Thank you, thank you Gail. Um, so my, my ending thoughts will be that um, I think that surgical care generally now is a moral and a socially ethical obligation that we must demand from our leaders. It's no longer something that should be put, pushed to the background. And whatever we do must take care of the, the, the most vulnerable components of our population and it's our children and maternal care. So, so I will say that it's a moral and social obligation that our leaders must uh, invest in. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ame. Jeff Ibbotson, Global Surgery Foundation, your final thoughts today. I just want to, thanks Gail, and I just want to reiter, reiterate on some of the things that have already been said, and I'll just say it in a few words. Partnership, collaboration, and I'll end with something that Nema touches on. And that's my strong conviction that this whole process has to be led by people on the field, not by people in high income countries and a top down approach. We need to have people in the driving seat, driving the agendas where it matters. And so for all of the listeners, I would encourage you to become a champion in your home country and to start the process there. Be the leaders that we need in this collaborative process. So I'll end with that, thank you. Thank you, Jeff Ibbotson. And so to a leader, uh, a thought leader and an activist, John Mira, I'll have you close out our final bit of our lightning round with the panelists and then Key, if you could close the webinar for us. Dr. Mira. Thank you. So I'll just summarize what I said before. But first, I agree with all the things that the panelists have said. And, and of course, equity and reaching out to vulnerable populations, that's why we're here. In order to get to some of those goals, though, I think we need to get out of our comfort zone. We need to proactively work with capital markets, with financial markets, and we need to proactively work with the pandemic preparedness community. And I think that's really going to be critical in the next two to three years. Thanks, John. I mean, so we, we're at the hour. We got to close up. So that's, not, that's all the time we have. So uh, first, let me thank all the panel members uh, uh, for taking the time to join us today. Thank you all to the, all the audience for joining us in these, uh, today. And thank you for all our partners for making all this possible. We hope that you will join us for our next three other webinars that are on the schedule. Tomorrow, Thursday, we'll talk about obstetrics during COVID-19, delivering for mothers and babies. Friday, we'll discuss the trauma uh, case, who cares? And Sunday, the topic will be anesthesia, getting to the tipping point. So we have terrific panels ready to discuss each of these three topics. You can register at the g4alliance.org, at SOTA online. You, I hope you will join us. By the way, all these uh, uh, webinars will be recorded and will be available uh, in English and Spanish and in French, uh, and then at the G4 Alliance website. I want to thank the the back team that's helped us to make this possible, uh, specifically uh, people like Nathan Schloven, and Anusha and, and Adam Amar, and so also to our interpreters in French and Spanish. And then also to, on behalf of all the members of G4 and all the patients in the, in, in, that, that are neglected, surgical patients, we thank you for joining today. Good day.
Thank you, everyone. Thanks all, all of our panel. Thanks all the support staff I, that have been on making this possible. Thank you for the, the, the last few attendees that haven't logged off yet. Um, but uh, I'm just so pleased and so happy that, that you guys were all able to join us uh, today uh, for such a stimulating and exciting discussion uh, with some very thought provoking ideas and challenges. And, and uh, I think we got people thinking about how to move forward uh, in the, the surgery issue. Um, uh, I hope many of you will join us, uh, as Key mentioned, for the next three days. Um, we've got uh, exciting webinars uh, planning, following up exactly some of the comments that were talked about here today about obstetrics, about trauma, and about anesthesia. Uh, so thank you so much, Gail and, and Key. You did a marvelous job. Uh, organizing this and then and then moderating the discussion. Uh, just wonderful. And each of our members of the panel, thank you for what each one of you contributed. Uh, it was fantastic. And thanks for uh, our, our support team who was fielding questions and passing them on to Gail and, and Key. Thank you guys very much. Let me just say thank you to everyone. That was an amazing group effort. And I feel so optimistic about what we all can do together going forward. So thank you. We will be in touch, believe me, um, and, uh, and just continue uh, pushing the envelope, doing the good work that we all want to do and want to do together on behalf of vulnerable patients. So thank you. Thank you, Gail, and thank you, Kipa, for moderating the session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, Key, and the whole team. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Gail, and, and uh, the whole team. That was great.